It's time to take a ride on the Steelers Afternoon Drive with our co-hosts, Alan Saunders and Zachary Smith. Welcome back to another episode of Steelers Afternoon Drive. I'm Zachary Smith. That is Alan Saunders. Alan, how are you feeling on this fine Thursday? I'm feeling pretty good. I'm feeling pretty good. Not as good as Paul Skeens, uh, but, you know, I'm pretty good. Repping my uh, Paul Steen shirt right now via Game Changers as we speak. Yeah, um, yeah Paul Steen looks uh, really good, and uh, that's a big conversation. Literally in the moment, breaking the fourth wall is time of recording this. No hits, seven innings, pulled at 99 pitches, 11 strikeouts. Hot topic, hotly debated online right before we jumped on here recording. Uh, actually, before we get into the football stuff, actually, I would like to get your take on that. Actually, I would like to... Uh, so. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think this is one of those things where like a hundred percent of managers would pull their start. Yeah, people pitcher. make it. So here, here's the thing where like I here's I'll a, give it some. Here's a uh, here's the thing. A hundred percent, all thirty MLB managers would make this move if tomorrow all thirty of those guys got fired and thirty guys that are not currently MLB managers got hired to fill those roles. All 30 of those guys would also still make that decision. There's no one even like five steps from being in a position to make this decision that would not pull Paul Skeens right now. Like that, everyone would do that. Everyone. Here's the reason that as a fan, as a, like I was having a text exchange with somebody and I was like, he's done this two times through 11 starts. He's going to have another opportunity to go the distance. So let's just get that out of the way right now. The, the reason that they came back with me and said they felt differently about it this time as opposed to the first time was because they have the all-star break coming up. Now, Paul Steen's part of the all-star game. Very well. She's not for the getting the break. <laughs> that, that's <laughs> yeah. If he wasn't did, pitching yeah. in the all-star game and I guess, you know, I, like, here's the thing you're, you're, you're taking out your pitcher because he's at the up near the upward limit of how long you're comfortable pitching him. But the other part of this is you have bullpen guys whose job it is to finish the game. Like the no hitter doesn't really matter. You just, just win. Right. Like it, it doesn't like the no hitter is a piece of trivia. Like it, it's, it's, it's not, like to me, it's not more important to have a no hitter than it is to pitch in the, in the all-star game. Like those are equally like, essentially only personal things that don't really matter in the big picture. So like, I, that doesn't, that's, that's really neither here, here nor there to me. Like, I, I don't know. Like, what would you rather have? Would you rather, I get like, if you're the pitcher, would you rather stay in and try to chase the no hitter and then lose the all-star game? I don't know. Like, I got, I think that's, I feel like he would, uh, but that's guessing. So like, I don't know what his answer to that would be, but I don't know. I, I think he would have liked to have stayed in that game, but I do not have anything against pulling him because like you said, I think everybody makes that same call in that same yeah. spot. Yeah. Um, what is the football he, equivalent of that? I was just going to say where yeah. every, everybody in the game is like, yeah, man, that's just what you do. And all the fans are like, why would they do this? What, what's the, uh, if somebody, football? maybe if a player is chasing something like a, an individual player is chasing a statistical, goal but they are like up by so many points and they decide to pull them from the game for a backup i don't know hmm. I, I don't know what the i think is. i think in general uh baseball managers general managers and people in front offices are smarter than baseball fans and football coaches are dumber than football fans like when it comes to like in-game strategy tactics like what's actually best like i, I feel like football coaches are way behind the curve in terms of like data analytics, like a plus, like the fans know better in football. I, I don't, I think in baseball, how, how do we get to that point? I don't, so I don't think there is, I don't think there is an equivalent. Like the equivalent is the opposite. The equivalent is the fan pulling their hair out because they're like old school head coach refuses to go for two. Like that, like, like when he should, or, or is punting on fourth mm. and three from the plus 40 yard line. Right? Like it's, it's the opposite way in football. Honestly, the the punting thing was going to be what I brought up, just because I feel like that can be equated to to Tomlin over the years. Yeah, uh, punting in situations where I feel like they shouldn't. Anyways, 
uh alan you put out a post today on x for today's show that you wanted to to dive into and honestly I, i've missed a lot of this conversation i'm just going to kind of be like navigating through this convo along with you and letting you get on a, a soapbox here this isn't pff convo let's start by saying that because we know when we talk about alan and soapboxes a long a lot of the times that means that conversation but alan you can set yourself up for this one where are we going with today's episode yeah so pablo tori of um I, you know, I don't, I don't know the name of the company. He's on with Dan Levitard and, and, and Stu Gotts and the, their, their podcast uh, network uh, there. Uh, had, had a take, I believe it was uh, yesterday, that he, ha he, he is anti the jargon. So it was a response to a clip from the offseason version of Hard Knocks where Drake May was like reciting plays back to, uh, I think it was the giant staff in a pre-draft interview, something like that. And, you know, the way an NFL play call works has like different parts. And so he's saying like things that don't make any sense to a random person, like, you know, dog 14, blue 78, you know, Yankee zebra means something to somebody. It just doesn't mean anything to you. And so, uh, you know, Pablo was kind of talking about how he doesn't like this jargonification of sports where everybody talks in this lingo that doesn't make sense to ordinary people. And I think there's a, a, an interesting point to be made there, but like, here's, here's my, my initial re response to that. I friggin' love jargon. I love it. I think it's awesome. And I think it's a great way to tap into the passion that people have for the game with knowledge. Like to me, if you're, if you're complaining about the sports media landscape in 2024 and you're talking about, Oh, this guy talk, does nothing but speak in technical terms. And, and, you know, he's, he's talking way over people's heads and he's probably only saying these things to try to sound smart. And he may not even really understand what he's talking about, even though he's using all these, sort of buzzwords and phrases to try to make it sound like he does. Like, I don't necessarily think there's like, like that's false, but the alternative is skip Bayless yelling at the TV screen for 30 minutes. Like so much of what we have in this means landscape is completely mindless. Like it has no facts. It's just random strung together. irate opinions without founding and I give me the jargon. Like I, I, I give me the, give me the guy who is at least showing an attempt at a search for knowledge and, and, and truth and meaning. Yeah. Like you, yeah, maybe he doesn't understand it. Maybe he's not doing a very good job of explaining it to the audience. And, and certainly those are valid critiques, but I want the guy that wants to know what that means when he sees hard knocks and ha has, Drake may explaining the parts of a play call, like that search for knowledge is what we're supposed to be doing. Give me the jargon. Yeah. Well, what's funny is I feel like this conversation can kind of be tied back to this show because I remember when, like we first started some of the conversations we have, and I, I don't want to say that we dive too deep into this stuff typically, although that is something that you want to do today. I remember some of the comments right off the bat where people were talking about being able to take things that weren't necessarily so simple and, and simplifying them and people giving you a lot of credit for doing so. And Derek Bell of the site, also the same thing, whether it's in writing form or over on his uh, personal YouTube channel, doing similar stuff. So I feel like this conversation, conversation does kind of tie back to what we're doing here and, and what Derek does on his channel. Yeah, I think so too. Like, I, I just think, look, I think the best, the best, uh, the best of us, the best of sports media takes jargon and gives it meaning and creates an emotional tie to that process in a way that works right um we all remember the play that the kansas city chiefs ran to win the super bowl they mm -hmm. they named it tom and jerry right that was the name of their play and it's like a it's like a you know a, a little little cat and mouse kind of kind of play call where you, you kind of make everybody think you're doing one thing and you run to another okay 
uh, and and corn dog was the name of the one they ran before. Okay, these things don't mean anything. Those phrases are intentionally meaningless so that you can say it out loud in the huddle and the defense doesn't know what you're saying. Like that's why you give them those names. They mean nothing to anyone mm-hmm. without context. But when you give it context and you're able to explain what it means, maybe why the name is like a little bit cute, right? Like why it fits the cartoon character name it's it, it's been given what what it why it worked why they called it then uh, why it was successful you know like what why it's Andy Reid's favorite give me the breakdown of the play why you know whose jobs were important and then tie that all up in a little path like that's meaningful that's what that's what we're supposed to be doing and the jargon is a key part of it if i give you a 10 minute explanation about why the play that the chiefs won the super bowl with worked and what it was and who did what and everything that is not going to stick with you the audience the same way without the name without the jargon without the terminology right like it is a part of it it is a, and 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 the other way is it's a part of the sort of quest for knowledge right remember when uh, peyton manning was uh you know doing his, his his cadence and and he would say omaha just there was like one game he just started doing he said it over and over again the whole world wanted to know the next day what does omaha mean what is he doing why is he doing it like yeah that that's 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 like that's the gist of what we do give me the jargon i i love that stuff I and mean, i think the audience loves that stuff too I, I and i can understand like there's a point where you just speak over technically and you talk over people's heads, you have to do a good job of explaining what it means. Um, but like, man, that's, if, if you're not into that stuff, why are you doing this? I don't know. I don't get it. That That's a good point too. I, I guess what I think about, and you, you brought this up uh, briefly within talking about that is you look at like what the alternative is not, not really explaining that side of it like deep into it it's just like the on the surface take with no explanation as to why you have that take or not really diving into why this happened or why that happened just just setting up something on the surface level yeah just in a hot take yeah isn't this guy the greatest or isn't this guy the worst or i hate <laughs> this or i hate that or i love this or i love that like man you all can do that at the bar and i'm um, you know like and i'm not saying that that, that isn't sometimes entertaining but there's no knowledge being distributed there. It's just takery. I, I don't know. I, I would much rather have an intense amount of jargon and maybe too much jargon than not enough. I think we have a I think we have a, a much bigger not enough jargon problem than we do ha- than we have a too much jargon problem. I well, I was going to say, is it that or is it the people that kind of get into too much? don't have the the platform where it's being seen so like the people with the the higher levels of platform the bigger uh, platform i mean i think are... look like i think you can do they have like skip bayless's platform Stephen a's platform no but like dan orlovsky has a pretty darn big platform you know mm-hmm. like you know baldy has a big platform jt o'sullivan has a big platform trevor sycamore yeah. has a big platform like there's lots of guys that do this stuff uh, the, the break things down that have big platforms. I, I, and I think that's proof that there is an audience for that, uh, that people don't just want to be yeah. yelled at and given their opinions, uh, you know, beaten over the head with, with shouting. Like, I, I think that those guys look, Dan Orlovsky was a, sorry, Dan, if you're happen to be listening, was a terrible quarterback. Like he wasn't, he's not Tom Brady going to the broadcast booth. No one was clamoring for his takes. Like he had to go out there and say like, Hey, I have to prove my bona fides and show that I know what I'm talking about, but also that I, not only do I know it, I can explain it to you and I can do it in a way that's entertaining and captivating. Like that's difficult. And I, he has earned everything he's gotten, but it, there's no Dan Orlovsky without jargon. Like it just doesn't exist. Like that's, that's part and parcel. What's made him, him. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I fully agree. I was just to that point, you, you listed off some great people that uh, that do have, you know, 
put a lot of jargon into it. So, like, I guess my question was, are the people or is it a, a lack of or is it just a lack of exposure for people, for some of the people that do? There's certainly names you could throw out there that are in the space. Yeah, I but mean, I think I think the people that really want it are finding it. Certainly. I do think, though, that the sort of mass market targeted stuff uh, could use more of that. Man, you know, like I think, um, and and we're going to a third sport on this podcast today. I think Mike Lang is one of the greatest broadcasters ever, not only because of his flashy catchphrases and because hockey is an incredibly technically demanding sport to call play by play, and he is just technically a, a one of the best ever at it. But he taught people the game. He found a way to work into his broadcast the terminology and the explanation. You know. Um, it, it, it was that, that's what that to me that's what made him great is that he understood that his audience didn't understand that hockey had not been like there weren't a lot of hot former hockey players out there in the audience he needed to teach people what the game was all about while he was explaining what the penguins were doing on the ice i think that's what made him so good yeah i think that's um i think it's a big part of it and and i think that uh man i, I don't know i i understand what he's saying i i think there's there's some places where it gets to be too much, but I think that's that's by far the the exception rather than the rule. Yeah. <clears throat> so you put out on X what people would want to know about um, for this reason. And uh, T. Walker said, I know zero practical knowledge of defensive terms. I can't look at a defense and know if it's in base, nickel, dime, likewise with cover, sleet, cover three, cover four, etc. Yeah. So this is... This is actually pretty easy. And this is one of those things where like sometimes I feel like we get in a trap as writers where like I want to talk about a concept a lot and so I just use its name without explaining what it is when really I should probably explain it every time because there are going to be people that are not going to understand what I'm talking about. So, I've never done this before on this show. We're going to see how it goes. If it if it goes poorly, maybe we'll find a better solution. But I'm going to I'm going to put some stuff on the little whiteboard here. Let's uh, see if I can get this. I'm going to have to be upside down. So this is going to be uh, rather difficult. And let's see if we can get that bad light shadow out of there. Okay. Well, maybe a little better. All right. We're, we're doing the best we can here. Okay. So on um, football play diagrams, the offense is in circles. The center is a square. And the defense is is x's all right so we got our can you see that no uh-huh all right so we got our offense there yep um the defense so a three four defense look th this is where the terminology is like weird because what three four is really just saying is on the line of scrimmage here you're gonna have three guys and off the line of scrimmage here you're gonna have four guys and but really, you you can move them around all you want. Like the three four is not a play; that is a a personnel package or a defensive scheme, right? So three four just really means that on the field you have three defensive linemen and you have four linebackers, right? So Steelers traditionally, you know, in their three four, they're going to have a guy here on the nose, okay? They're going to have a guy here just over the inside shoulder of the tackle. They're going to have a guy here just over the inside shoulder of the tackle. And then you're going to have, uh, you know, Alex Highsmith here, TJ Watt here, a couple of linebackers back here, right? 3-4, okay? But, like, it doesn't stop being a 3-4 if, uh, you know, a Landon Roberts comes down here and puts his and, – and, and, and you know, and stands in between the two, the, the nose tackle and the end. It doesn't stop being a 3-4 – if, uh, you know, Alex Highsmith and TJ Watt flip sides, or maybe they both go over here to the strong side, you know, it, it's still a three. So the you know, three, four defense just means you have three defensive linemen and four linebackers on the field. What is a defensive lineman and linebacker? Like the Steelers use their outside linebackers as basically defensive ends. Like you could really call the Steelers base defense a five, two, as you see that, you know, you could just draw this line a little bit differently. I didn't move anybody, and now we're calling it a 5-2. Uh, the Steelers call their base defense Oki. That is the name that they give it. 
the, their base defense, a three four defense, Oki. It's because it was uh, popularized at the University of Oklahoma back in uh, the early eighties, I believe. And uh, it's also literally the name of my uncle's dog. Just to throw Oki. that in there. That's a yes. good name. Is it O K I E, or is it yeah, O? Uh, because O K I E is the is the well, that's what you call someone from Oklahoma. Um. Yes, I was searching through text here to see if he ever. Yep, that's yeah. how he spelled it in text. So yes. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, that's um, that's that's a three four defense, a four three defense, like what the Cleveland Browns use. Since we talk about the difference between like TJ and Miles mm-hmm. Garrett all the time, they're gonna have four guys down here, two on either side of the center, and three linebackers. Like that. If you think about the sort of classic, um, you know, uh, th- this is like a very generic football formation. This is what mm-hmm. most high school teams use, for example, stuff like that. Okay. And then you can kind of break things down, right? So these guys are tackles. These guys are ends, middle linebacker. So if the tight ends here, you would call this a strong side linebacker. Well, because you got to yell all this stuff out over time, you know, you're yelling it out. You know, you yell, hey, Terry, you're the strong side linebacker, and I'm the weak side linebacker. This would be the weak side linebacker. So when they draw this up on the play, you know, they're going to give these guys a little, okay, that's a S, that's a M, and that's a W. And so over the years, oh, that's a terrible S. Over the years, these have become known as Sam, Mike, and Will, right? These are just names. These are things you can yell. Like, you don't need to know that this is the Will linebacker, the weak side linebacker. He's smaller. He's going to play away from the tight end. He's going to do more pass coverage and less smashing into guys and run. Um, The Steelers used to name their inside linebackers, still do to some extent, uh, Mac and Buck were their two inside linebackers. Okay. (laughs) And the, you know, the Mac linebacker was uh, a guy who was a little bit, um, better in coverage and a little bit uh you know sl- more slender um and the buck linebacker was a big strong tough guy uh and so there's um th- there's there's all these names and all this terminology but i think you know really 3 4 is a is a personnel group more than it is anything else um and then you know a nickel means you're going to take one of these guys off the field for an extra defensive back. So in a 4-3 defense, in the nickel, usually you take out your mic, okay? Or you take out your will, leave your mic, and then you have a nickel back here who's a corner. All right, 3-4, what do the Steelers do? They take out their nose tackle, right? And they leave these four down here, and now they have a nickel back. Okay, so it's a little bit different. And then the dime. The dime is just a name, another name for a sub package. So in the dime, you're going to take away another linebacker and you're going to give it a dime back. And the Steelers generally take away one of their inside linebackers, and then they have a dime back over there. So that's that's how you, you know, some some teams play a quarter defense, quarter defense of three down linemen. You can come up with names for anything. And there's all sorts of these, like, that don't fit that sort of same three, four, or pocket change uh, sort of nomenclature. The Chicago Bears, a 46 defense, that was eight men in the box. That, that was... That was four over four. Um, and so you've got all kinds of and, – and that one was called the 46 defense because that extra guy in the box, that fourth linebacker, was number 46. That's why they called it the 46 defense. It doesn't have anything to do with the sort of same way the other ones are named. But all these names of defenses are just what kind of players do you have on the field? And then you'll have plays which have different names, you know, both in kinds of plays and, and in and – in, you know, their actual names too, but he mentioned some coverages. Coverage yeah, is very, c- coverage is very easy. So uh, we're going to go this way. All right. Here's our defense. Here's our Steelers base, base defense, right? All right. Then we have our, our DBs one here, one here, and two somewhere in the middle. All right. Corners and safeties. So zones and man are the two ways you generally cover. And in man, you're just going to draw a line from each guy 
in coverage to somebody on the offense. They each have one. I got him. I got him. Just like in basketball, man to man. Okay. In zone, you cover a guy in an area and the number next to the cover is the number of zones you have. So let's say you're going to still have all these guys in man, but uh, DeMonte KZ here is he's just going to play center field zone. Okay. Now you see there are only five eligible receivers, so you can play cover one and still have everybody singled up all the way across the field. Like we have cover one zone, and then we still have you know everybody singled up. Okay, cover two. We're gonna take this away, and then we have two of them, right? And then uh, you know the the classic Steelers defense has that strong safety down the box with a man to man assignment and has the corners playing zone as well. That's cover three. Uh, if you're a fan of the uh, University of Pittsburgh, Pat Narduzzi, they play almost every down. Quarters, cover four. One, two, three, four. And then you can also have, like, man underneath. See, like, in this cover three, my linebackers are in man still. Or you can give your linebackers little zones too. You can zone off the linebackers too. But so cover – is is whether you it's how many safeties you have, how many zones you're covering. In. So cover zero is just pure man to man, five on five. Cover one, two, three, four, and then there's like some you can do quarter, quarter, half, where you're doing this on one side of the field, you're doing this on the other side. There's lots of ways you can make it more complicated, but that's some of the terminology that goes into building a defense. And then there was one question that wasn't this question, like what's a scheme? And that was a very simple but very difficult to answer question. Actually, it said, what the F is a scheme? What the F is a scheme? <laughs> so the scheme is all of this, okay? So, like, the Steelers play – the scheme is like the the um, the introductory paragraph for your, for your unit, right? The Steelers are going to play a 3-4 defense – with a 4-2-5 nickel and a 4-2-5 heavy nickel, three safeties, and a 4-1-6 dime. And they also have a goal line package and some other weird ones. But that's mostly the personnel groupings they're going to play. Okay, They're going to mostly play some combination of cover one, two, three on the back. Oh, that may change a little bit it has changed traditionally they played extensively cover three um if you're thinking like back to like rod woodson ike taylor uh you know those guys were playing cover three all the time um and basically what's your angle how are you how are you beating how are you using this scheme to beat the opponent you know and so like this the, the scheme is is the intent here it's the it's the personnel, it's the kind of plays we call. Back when the Steelers ran all kinds of three, four, cover three, right? So we do three, four, DB, DB, safety, DB, and we're gonna do cover three. I need to move you this way. So we've got three zones, right? And we've got these guys down here. Well, these three defensive linemen, we know they're rushing. I, if you're a longtime Steelers fan, I know you're going to recognize what I'm about to show you just by where I put the arrow, right? One guy going this way, second guy going this way, okay? This is a double-A gap blitz, right? They cross the inside linebackers, okay? So you can see that we're rushing too many. We've left, you know, obviously these guys rush, right? We don't have anybody left. We're covering the tight end probably here, okay? We've got a slot receiver maybe, or we've got a running back coming out of the backfield. So oftentimes one of these guys over here, and they you know vary it up, he's gonna drop a lineman is gonna drop into coverage. So th this is a zone blitz. That's what that's called. So you're you're dropping one of your or a zone dog, you're dropping one of your defensive linemen into a zone underneath because you're rushing too many guys and you you know you don't want to leave a guy accounted for. If you call like somebody calls something a jailbreak blitz, that means basically you know you're leaving someone uncovered. Like you are intentionally having an offensive player that you do not have anybody either in a zone that is feasible for them to run to or in man-to-man -man coverage. So like th what's the scheme? It's it's all of this. It's how it's the play calls. It's how the play calls and the and the uh the personnel groupings and the players themselves interact to provide an advantage 
for your team a tactical advantage. So that's that's a really um, I'll call it high level question for uh, that board right now for what the f is a scheme. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, so the other one uh, that came in from Patrick was wide zone versus outside zone, and. I mean, just on the surface, right? Like, I mean, you can tell me if I'm if I'm missing something here. Um, I feel like wide zone is kind of like, I don't know, the marriage of the inside and outside or compromise, probably a better word than marriage of the two, because you still want to get the defenders stretched out. But then it's more about like puncturing where those gaps are as, op- as opposed to just trying to go as wide as possible. I was trying to be colorful. You know, I don't know, the other colors aren't, aren't working. How many so, colors I- you got? I don't know. I had a bunch, but only black seems to be working. All right, so here's our offensive line. First of all, let's talk about man versus zone, get gap versus zone runs, right? So yeah. in a gap run, each offensive lineman is going to have a specific assignment. Block that player, block that player, block that player, right? In a zone run, it, it, if you want to call this same play, okay, this is a, a, man, a, a gap run. Let's say we're now against a, an even front, a 4-2, a okay, even number of guys. Well, now we have to change the assignments, right? It's not going to work, okay? So now we're going to say, okay, we're going we're gonna to keep this double team here. we got to solo block all the rest, right? We have to change the assignments because it's against a different kind of defense. In zone, the opponent and where they're lined up doesn't matter. This guy blocks whatever's there. 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 This... It's outside zone. Um, that's the basic. So I'll say that the outside zone and wide zone are basically blocked the same. I think the really difference between the two of them is kind of the intent. Where outside zone, you really the the whole play is designed for you to get outside of this this last tackle. Usually, you're going to have like a slot receiver or a tight end or somebody over here going this way too, and then a wide receiver stock blocking up there. Um, you know, the whole point of this play is to go this way. Whereas the wide zone, I would say, you know, if I'm drawing this line here, the wide zone, I'm kind of doing like that, that you're kind of giving the running back a little bit more freedom to decide where he wants to take advantage of the defense and kind of, it's, it's more focused on the cutback. I would say I bet wide zone does not get run outside the tight end more often than not. Like most of the time, the running back is going to pick one of these. And then, of course, inside zone is just, there you go, straight up. Um, and so you have, um, and look, there's 100,000 play calls. Uh, they're all different variations of little things, but I feel like that was, uh, that's another good question. So this is the Arthur Smith staple. This, the the outside zone is like old school, like, Mike Shanahan, um, mm-hmm. you know, way way back, uh, Washington Redskins kind of play. Um, so that's that's what I got. Smitty, is there anything you want to know? I, you know what? I was trying to like sit here and think of something that would kind of fall into this bracket, but I don't think so. Uh, Are you just embarrassed <laughs> to admit that you don't know the thing that you want to know? Because I feel like that is a part of this, too. It's like when things become jargon and then they get used all the time, then people don't want to be like, what's cover two? Like, you know, like they, it, they don't want to sound dumb. I mean, nothing's coming to mind right now. I, I'd like to think that I'm relatively nuanced. I'm a... I think you're... You have serious knowledge. Like, let's, let's be real. <laughs> like you, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm, tr- I'm sitting here trying to think of a good example, but yeah, I think um, I think talking about this stuff is cool, and I understand it's not for everyone, and not everybody wants to know all this. But like, man, I don't know. I think it's fun. I think it's a good thing that we do. I want to. I want to. Well, in the, in the, it's not something that we necessarily always do. At least like like this, like this. No, this hasn't really. happened but. like this before. So I feel like this episode, we're gonna really get to know the audience here. Is this something that they really enjoyed? Don't necessarily care about. Where are we at with this? Like, do we have uh, Pablo Torres of the world within the Steelers Afternoon Drive audience that aren't gonna care for this episode? I'm curious. I, I hope that uh, I hope that they like to change a pace on here and uh really enjoyed it but i don't know you got anything else i think that's it man i i think that's it 
Okay. Well, you know the drill. Tell the people they can find you for for stuff like this. You know, maybe we can get you just going live sometime, just drawing up on the whiteboard. Ooh, I could do that. At A Saunders <laughs> underscore PGH, PGH Steelers now, Steelers now.com. Like and subscribe to YouTube channel. Hit the bell for notifications. Check us out on TikTok at Steelers Afternoon Drive. I'm on TikTok too. A Saunders underscore PGH there. Yeah, that's it, man. There we go. Hey, be sure to, uh, it's 7 Eleven. So be sure to go grab your free Slurpee at 7 Eleven if you have a 7 Eleven near you. Um, yeah, be sure to like, subscribe, hit that notification bell. Uh, hit us in the comments with your thoughts, obviously, on, on the great discussion we had today, how you feel about all the jargon provided by Alan Saunders on today's episode, uh, or some questions for future episodes, of course. If you're listening somewhere else, Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast from, be sure to leave us a five star review and subscribe over there. Hit the notification bell so you guys will get a, an alert when a new podcast drops on all the audio platforms. Follow us on TikTok. As Alan says, he was after drive trying to post 90 second clips over there. Same thing with YouTube shorts, but if you guys are on YouTube, you get that anyway if you hit that notification bell. Follow me everywhere, Zachary Smith, PGH, Brown Saunders, and myself. Thanks for jumping in. Take another ride on the Steelers afternoon drive. Mm-hmm.